Welcome to the Art of Catholic uh, podcast, and uh, I have a great guest, a repeat guest on today's episode. His name is Dr. John Bergsman. I already gave you the tail of the tape on him, but let me just say that he is uh, he's one of my favorite people. He's a man who's really striving after holiness. He gives great talks at conferences. <laughs> For those of you not watching on YouTube, he was just uh, patting himself on the back, essentially. <laughs> And he has a great sense of humor, as you can see. But uh, I really enjoy uh, my conversations with him. I enjoy being with him. And uh, he and I are actually going to be speaking at a conference together in North Carolina uh, next year. So look for that, those of you in North Carolina, uh, the Ignite Conference. But he is, among other things, I mean, he's a great biblical scholar. He's got all kinds of di different directions that he could go. You've heard me list his books out already with his Bible basics, which is a bestseller, and his New Testament basics, and his Psalm basics, and all that. Well, he's got a new book out, and this is really kind of a wheelhouse topic for him, and it's called Jesus and the Dead Sea Scrolls. Subtitle is Unlocking the Jewish Roots of Christianity. Here it is. Uh, this is my review copy that the publisher sent me, and then I got another one as well. But I've read uh, most of this book, and it is really fascinating. And so I thought, uh, John, let's do a, a podcast on this, and he readily agreed. So, John, welcome back to The Art of Catholic. Hey, it's great to be with you, Matt, as always. <laughs> now, some people look at the title and are like, well, you know, I've heard of the Dead Sea Scrolls. I've certainly heard of this Jesus guy. Um <laughs> What exactly are the Dead Sea Scrolls? Give the audience some context of what they are, some of the history of Qumran and how it's all connected, what happened, so we know what we're talking about. Yeah, absolutely. So um, during the, uh, about, uh, around the year 150 BC, okay, so about 150 years before our Lord's birth, um, some Jewish men who were seeking holiness and awaiting the Messiah devoutly and ardently um, established what we would perceive as a monastery on the northwest shore of the Dead Sea. And they went out there to prepare for the coming of the Messiah. And they lived, you know, what we would recognize as a monastic life, about 100 to 200 guys out in the desert. They built their own buildings out of rock, etc., prayed, worked, worshipped, studied the scriptures, and they kept that up till shortly before uh, A.D. Uh, 70, around the time when, when Jerusalem was destroyed in the year 70. So from 150 to about shortly before 70, they're out there worshipping. Now, around 1947, some Bedouin shepherds stumbled across the remains of their library, what had happened was shortly before Jerusalem was destroyed, the Romans also destroyed this monastery. Before the soldiers got there, the monks hid their scriptures and all their sacred writings uh, in uh, jars up in caves uh, surrounding their site of their, of their dwelling. And uh, they remained there um, largely undisturbed uh, for, you know, 20 centuries, roughly speaking. Until, again, a Bedouin shepherd threw a rock into one of the caves uh, in the winter of uh, maybe late 1946 into 1947, heard some breaking of pottery, went in to investigate, discovered these scrolls. They, the, the shepherds were hoping for gold, you know, and they were massively dis disappointed to find nothing but these old <laughs> scrolls, not realizing that these scrolls were so valuable that the state of Israel would... Uh, in, a, in a few decades, build a uh, hundred million dollar, you know, bunker like museum to to preserve these things. But uh, anyway, they were kind of disappointed. And eventually these um, these scrolls were um, uh, made their way to some uh, Jewish scholars and to some uh, American scholars within uh, about a year and a half who began to recognize their age, their antiquity, et cetera. And then it just blew up in the worldwide news that here we've got um, we've got writings that were physically written during the lifetime of Jesus and even earlier. That that just my to put that in perspective, Matt. Um, we found that one of the first scrolls that they discovered was a complete copy of the Book of Isaiah, dating possibly from as early as 250 BC. Wow. 
And our oldest complete copy of any book of the Old Testament prior to this time dated from around 1000 AD. So with one discovery, you move 1200 years earlier in terms of your uh, physical copies of the Bible. And that in itself was astounding, but so much other, uh, so many other facts about this this community that left us these these scrolls is fascinating. But that was just the beginning of it. So you said these guys were hoping for gold. Now you and I both been have both been to Qumran. We've seen the museum and all the rest. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I remember when I was there, a lot of the scrolls are in they, they were torn into like I don't know shreds basically because these guys figured out that they would get money for each piece of the scrolls that they brought. And so some of the scrolls actually had to be like glued together and pieced together. Am I, am I mistaken in that? Do I remember that correctly? No, yeah, you, you remember that correctly. And um, the, uh, the issue there was not only um, the, the uh, Bedouin um, who were indeed um, tearing up some of the scrolls uh, in order to sell them and so on, that was actually uh, only rarely the case, though. Uh, more often the case, the uh, the scrolls were in fragments because, you know, worms and decay had taken their toll uh, on on them. Um, the, the Great Isaiah scroll that I referenced earlier, one of the first ones that they found, was one of the few scrolls that had no major damage to it. Most of the other scrolls were in fragmentary condition, uh, from on the one end of the spectrum, you know, having a few holes eaten by, you know, a few caterpillars to on the other end of the spectrum, like only a few scraps of the scroll being left. So I, we used to joke in grad school, they should have called them the Dead Sea school, the Dead Sea fragments, right? Because that's, <laughs> that's kind of how they, uh, they appear. You, you imagine these rolls of parchment and then you're shown them and they're just these little pieces like look like a jigsaw puzzle that you have to put together. But uh, yeah. Um, actually, you know, you know, while we're on this subject, Matt, I, I want to, uh, mention something that's a bit humorous, but I think has a theological message to it. Some of the better preserved scrolls were well preserved because they had been buried under six feet of bat guano in some of the caves. <laughs> so all this bat dung, okay, completely covered the jars. They were six <laughs> feet under the bat dung. And it was a we call an anaerobic environment, you know, no oxygen down there, so they were preserved. And uh, but I see I see a providential lesson in that, you know, that, that sometimes when God sends a little manure in your life, maybe there is a silver lining that He has tried to preserve something good for posterity through it all. So uh, it's almost the reverse the punter uh, terminology here, but you know what I'm, t I'm saying? It's, it's almost like the reverse of Luther's snow covered dung heaps is the other way yeah. around. <laughs> exactly. the dung was covering the gold there. So John, so much of what your book does sheds uh, light on Catholic teaching. And you already mentioned the, uh, the Isaiah scroll as being one of the primary ones that was found in great condition and all the rest of it. But what does uh, what do the scrolls and the, and the discovery of them have to tell us about like the canon of scripture, the makeup of the books that are in it, and maybe a couple of the highlights with regard to dating of of the Bible as well? Yeah, that's a very interesting question, Matt. Um, what what the scrolls reveal is that there was uh, a lot of discussion among the Jews in the time of our Lord uh, over which books were inspired. Um, I think before the discovery of the scrolls, it was much more common uh, for everyone to take a statement by the Jewish historian Josephus about, you know, all the Jews agreeing on biblical books um, in a straightforward manner. And um, I, I grew up hearing many Protestant arguments that, oh, you know, uh, the Protestant Bible, the Protestant canon of the Old Testament is the canon of Jesus's day. You know, and the the historical support for that was uh, was a quote from the Jewish historian Josephus, who describes these twenty two books that uh, that the, that the Jews revered. But what we found in the Dead Sea Scrolls is that they had more inspired books than other groups of Jews. And um, you know, for example, they uh, they had many copies of the Book of Jubilees and uh, the works that make up what we call First Enoch. 
and they revered these works and they certainly considered them to, to be inspired. So remember, our, our concept of Bible comes from having books that are bound on one side between two covers. And so you think of, you know, a, a, a permanent collection, you know, what, once you bind it, it's, it's all together for the rest of its life. But, you know, for ancient Jews, that we're talking about individual scrolls. And so the question of what's in your Bible is more like, which scrolls do you put in the sacred basket <laughs> rather than, you know, which ones do you scatter somewhere else? It's, it's a little bit more fluid. Regardless, uh, this is the point, Matt. The, uh, the Essenes were a group of Jews— <laughs> that used a lot of uh, sacred books that were later really revered by the early church, uh, some of which were accepted into the canon. And the, the prime one that I'd like to talk about is Tobit, because a number of copies of Tobit were found uh, at Qumran, at least five copies of Tobit, which is more than about a dozen so-called biblical books uh, of the Old Testament. You know, only, a, I think, one copy of uh, Joshua was found, and no copies of Nehemiah and uh, no copies of Esther, but five copies of Tobit. Uh, so they seem to really revere the book of Tobit. And uh, there's certain things that are said by uh, the ancient historians about their views of marriage that uh, only seem to really make sense if they were taking kind of the theology of marriage that you see in Tobit uh, seriously. And what I argue in the book is that um, they did, in fact, shape um uh, some of their views of marriage from things like that famous uh, bedtime prayer of Tobias that's often used in, in uh, Catholic uh, nuptial masses. Um, so to recap, uh, Matt, uh, what, the, what the scrolls show us is that during the time of our Lord, Jews were all over the map in terms of uh, how many uh, inspired books there were. There was different disagreement between different groups of Jews. Everybody was waiting for the Messiah to come, really, and solve this problem. And that's what we believe, indeed, that our Lord did, that he taught the apostles by word and example uh, which books were inspired, and that was passed down in the apostolic tradition, uh, ending up in our, our Catholic canon. And they thought that the Messiah was coming pretty quickly, didn't they? Yes, uh, like, kind of like any minute kind of expectation. They were an end times group, uh, you know, kind of like a, you and I remember the Branch Davidians from Waco, Texas, you know, <laughs> and all that kind of stuff. They were a little bit like that. They, you know, their contemporaries may have regarded them as a little bit crazy, but, you know, Jesus, you know, the Messiah coming any time. Uh, actually, they, their ideas about the Messiah were a little bit fluid. But their mainstream notions seem to coalesce around two figures, uh, a priestly Messiah and a royal Messiah. Uh, there, you know, two, two Messiahs. Uh, the technical term for this is diarchic Messianism, for what it's worth. But, you know, that's just basically <laughs> Greek for two Messiahs. And, um, yeah, which is kind of fascinating, uh, Matt, because when you look at the way that, for example, the Gospel of uh, Luke is written— um, the story of the Gospel of Luke doesn't begin just with Jesus. It, it begins with John the Baptist. Uh, why is that? Well, look at John's pedigree. You know, he, he's a priest through his father Zechariah. He's got a he's got a good priestly bloodline. And what I argue in the book is that um, you know the Gospel of Luke in particular, possibly other Gospels as well, is really among other things, you know, presenting Jesus in a way that would be attractive to the Essenes and showing them that understood correctly, John the Baptist and Jesus could be understood as the priestly Messiah and the royal Messiah that they had been expecting based on the Messianic prophecies. Oh, that's super interesting. And with that, let's let's pivot, because you draw some pretty dramatic conclusions in the book um, about various events and people, but central to it is a connection that you draw between the Essenes who lived in Qumran and St. John the Baptist. So what's the connection between the two of them? Yeah, this is this is really, uh, you know, uh, quite fascinating, uh, I think, because, you know, so often, Matt, when we read the gospel, we don't, you know, it's 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 decontextualized and we're so used to it. Like there's, there's all these odd things 
that happen in the Gospels that we don't think twice because most of us grow up hearing it and we just take it for granted. Oh, John the Baptist, you know, has this crazy diet because that's just the way he is, you know? <laughs> right, he's a crazy and his man. Parents, yeah. Yeah, and his parents sent him out into the wilderness because, hey, you know, he's got the Holy Spirit. So that enables a six-year-old to survive in the desert, you know. And we don't question it. We just want—it's the Word of God, and that's what, that's what he already always does. But what, what the scrolls do is give cultural background that makes sense of a lot of oddities that— non-Christians think are ridiculous, and Christians are just used to. Okay, so let's look at John the Baptist. He, there's many odd things about him that I think the scrolls illuminate. First of all, it says in Luke, I think it's near the end of Luke chapter 2, might be end of Luke 1, apologize, but um, that, that his parents, uh, you know, apparently sent him out, and he's in the wilderness until the day of his appearing to Israel, like basically the start of his career. So the wilderness means the desert. And so you get this mental image of Elizabeth and Zachariah, you know, shooing the child, John, you know, like, go out into the desert. <laughs> You'll be fine, honey. <laughs> yeah, you can, the grasshoppers are good eating, I hear. So, <laughs> Like, who does that to their kid? I wouldn't even let mine walk down the street, much less yeah. kick him out into the wilderness, for crying yeah. out loud. Since, you know, there's, there's brigands out there. <laughs> you know, there's thievery going on out Wild there. Wild animals. I mean, come Wild on. animals have nothing to eat, you know. But here, here's the thing. The, uh, the Essenes were living out there. If, if, in case we haven't mentioned this, this, this monastic group that's living out there, they're part of a broader movement called the Essenes. And uh, the, the, the physical site on the shore of the Dead Sea where they built their monastery, folks call that Qumran. So that's what Qumran means. It's, a, it's the site. So during the lifetime of John the Baptist, there was this operational monastery on the Dead Sea uh, coast. And the historians of the time tell us that the monks took in young boys and uh, formed them. It, they, they, li they literally used the term formed. They, they formed them according to their manner. So it's formation, okay? And so this is just like it was in medieval Europe. You know, you, you have a, maybe you're elderly. Remember, Zachariah and Elizabeth were very old. You know, maybe they felt too old to raise this boy. Um, so maybe they died early, you know? And he was orphaned, and, and the relatives sent him out. But, um, but he could get great, a great theological education with these monks. And so I think that that's what it means when it says he was out in the wilderness. And then there's a, there's a bunch of other uh, curiosities about John. You know, John has all this emphasis on water washing. When we look at this monastery, this monastery has more ritual pools in it than any other ecological site from anywhere near the time period. Because these monks washed all the time. And they talk about it in their literature. They, they did it for uh, purity reasons or for, for, the, for the forgiveness of their sins. So you got that water washing. Then, you know, John's place of ministry is only a few miles up the road from where the monastery was. You know, that seems to be, you know, hardly be coincidental. And then his diet. To, to me, one of the most striking things is really the diet issue. You know, why is he, you know, eating locusts and wild honey? Uh, again, we take it for granted. Well, that's just what he does because, you know, he likes grasshoppers, you know, or <laughs> whatever. Or it was, a, you know, it's a form of mortification. But, but well, why that? The historians of the time, though, explained to us that folks that were kicked out of the monastery often ended up almost dying because to get into the monastery, they had to swear these fearsome oaths not to eat anything for the rest of their lives except the food that was prepared at the monastery because it was sacred food. And when John leaves, what I think it, there, there's some kind of loophole that he was using to avoid breaking his oaths. Now, we don't have copies of all the stipulations of how the oath was worded, but I suspect it was something like this, that locusts and wild honey were unprepared by human hand so if the oath was phrased in that way, like food prepared elsewhere, I won't eat again, then that would get him out of it. Or possibly they weren't even considered food at all. They were just like 
edible aspects of the environment. So they weren't technically food, you know. Regardless, um, we know of other persons uh, down there who were also like eating off the land, who also I think were probably kicked out of the community. Okay, so pause, and, pause there yeah. for a second because sure. let's back up. So you said that Zachariah and Elizabeth looks like they you're you're arguing that they sent him out to Qumran to live with the Essenes and be formed there, right? And then you you pivot to him leaving or getting kicked out. So. You're right. saying that, all right, he was booted out and he was bound to certain oaths that he took while he was in community there because they had pretty strict penances that they did. And that's the reason why he's eating that crazy diet out in the wilderness that we just take for granted. Is that correct? Right. That's right. That's right. And so the missing piece that I didn't explain there is why did he get kicked out? Yeah, that's what I want to know. Right. Why did he get kicked out? Now, there's a couple of theories about this and, you know, uh, just, you know, different opinions out there. What I argue is it probably had something to do with his preaching. OK, because because what we notice about John the Baptist, that's so distinct from the essay. <laughs> I just laugh. Like, how many guys have been kicked out for preaching, John? <laughs> <laughs> I know. I know. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> Uh, yeah, John Chrysostom. Yeah, a lot of people get themselves in, in trouble by preaching too well. Did you ever have any trouble uh, with that when you were a pastor? I didn't get kicked out of my church, but people did walk out of my church <laughs> because of my preaching. Oh, gosh. But okay, anyway. Back to John. Is, so back to John the Baptist. John the Baptist preaches to everyone, okay, even to presumably Roman soldiers who come and ask him, you know, what must we do, et cetera. Because he's at a crossroads, right? He's at a place he's where at a lot of— Because he's at a crossroads, okay, right. right. Yeah. And and John associates himself with Isaiah. You know, when he's challenged, he, he, he goes to Isaiah to identify his vocation. Now, what you notice about the book of Isaiah, especially from chapters 40 through 66, the second half of the book, is that Isaiah is all about the good news going to the nations. Now, the Qumran monks, they loved Isaiah too. They quote it all the time, lots of copies of it. But they never deal with the issue of preaching to the nations. And in fact, they, by all appearances, they were not at all interested in preaching to the Gentiles, okay, mm. or to, to more broadly. And so I suspect where, the, where John and the Kermanites came at loggerheads was, what about these prophecies that were supposed to bring the good news out to the Gentiles? And once John started to agitate to do that, based on his meditation on Isaiah, I'll bet that got him kicked out of the community. And he said, okay, fine, if they're not going to do it, I'm going to do it. And there was a convenient place to do it, only a few miles upriver, where you have a major trade route crossing near Jericho, where all this Middle Eastern trade goes back and forth across the Jordan River to Jericho, then up into Jerusalem. And, and you can almost literally preach to the whole world by standing in one spot and letting the whole world pass you by. So there John shet, sets up shop, so to speak, and preaches and has a, a worldwide audience. And, um, and, 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 you know, but when we get into the book of Acts, Matt, Matt we find his disciples decades later all the way up in modern-day Turkey, up in Asia Minor. They're, they're disciples of John the Baptist that the apostles run into as they're spreading the gospel through that part of the world. So, you know, his, his uh, influence is radically mis— uh, as uh, George W. Bush, Bush would say, misunderestimated. Okay. <laughs> 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 That might be the first time he's ever been mentioned on my podcast. <laughs> okay, as W used to say, that's misunderestimating. Um, <laughs> we we think that John was just the, you know this this transitional figure, and it, indeed he was a transitional figure, but he had a huge socio political religious impact on his current generation that went far beyond even the geographical borders of Israel into other parts of the Mediterranean world. Yeah, and let's not forget that he was uh, empowered by the Holy Spirit at the uh, at the visitation, right? At the greeting yes. of Mary, and so he's filled with the Spirit, so he's been prepared by God to be put in this place so that he can preach to the Gentiles, he can preach to the entire world and and start to pave the way for our Lord. Now, you mentioned his disciples, that John the Baptist's disciples. So let's talk about one of them, because uh, 
it was the Apostle John, who, man, who became the Apostle John, was uh, one of his disciples. And you, you're a scholar of, of the Gospel of John. Uh, I've heard a, a number of your talks on it, and, and you rocked that book amazingly. So when you were looking uh, and studying the scrolls, uh, you saw a connection between the Gospel of John and John the Baptist. So explain quickly what that connection is and maybe what your biggest aha moment was when you realized this connection between the two of them. Sure, sure. Well, uh, a number of different things. But uh, first of all, um, while I was studying the scrolls and, and studying John, you know, all scholars immediately noticed that there are rare, unusual phrases uh, that are that virtually only occur in ancient literature in the Gospel of John and the Dead Sea Scrolls. And these odd phrases had been noticed before by scholars, and they were assumed to be the influence of Greek philosophy in later generations of Christianity, and therefore not uh, a, you know, not really authentic to the time period of our Lord. But then with the discovery of the scrolls, um, they saw that, oh, no, things like, you know, phrases like children of light, children of darkness, spirit of truth, spirit of falsehood, um, and many others that we might mention, uh, these were phrases that were current among the Jews of Jesus's own generation. And so that shifted the way the, uh, the Gospel of John looked to me and to other scholars. Suddenly it was like, aha, uh, this is kind of the street Jewish talk. You know, this is, this is the way they spoke in this narrow window of time before the destruction of Jerusalem and after the birth of Jesus, you know, between, you know, right there, because the scrolls are the only documents that were written, physically written during this time period that we still have. And, and here, here we see these, these, uh, this, this kind of terminology. So that's, uh, that's one thing, but, um, you know, in particular, Matt, John three always stumped me. You know, you'll recall this, this is the Obviously, the conversation between our Lord and Nicodemus, where Nicodemus comes to the Lord at night, says, uh, we know you're a teacher from God, etc. And then Jesus launches into this cryptic teaching about, unless a man is born of water and spirit, he cannot see the kingdom of heaven, etc. And the problem there, Matt, is, as we read it as Christian readers, Jesus is clearly talking about baptism. Like, what else can being born again of water and the spirit mean? But Jesus gets frustrated with Nicodemus when Nicodemus doesn't understand what he's talking about. Like, how does that make sense? How could Jesus, the God-man who has no sin, get mad or get, get frustrated with this Jewish ruler for not understanding about baptism, which is something that Jesus himself is only going to introduce later on or, or that we're only going to like fully understand in, a, in about 20 years or something like this, you know? <laughs> so... John 3 looks for all the world like some kind of fictitious event that was written by Christians later and then imported back and kind of fictionally put into the life of Jesus. It looks like what we call technically anachronistic, right? Like it doesn't fit. So this is my personal aha moment. When I was studying, studying the scrolls, it becomes very clear from the scrolls that these monks were practicing a daily water washing that they believed communicated to them the Holy Spirit for the forgiveness of sins. And they were basing this off of prophecies like Isaiah 42, Isaiah 44, Ezekiel 36 that talk about the water and the spirit uh, being poured out by God in the later time when there's going to be a new covenant, etc. And they were organizing themselves as a new covenant. And they were doing this up to a hundred years before the birth of our Lord. So there was already in the time of our Lord a an established tradition among at least one of the traditions of the Jews, one of the sects of Jews, of, yes, already practicing a water washing that was expecting the Holy Spirit to work through this that was associated with the New Covenant. So Nicodemus could have been aware of this. In fact, you would expect him to be aware of it because 
he's supposed to be kind of a theologian because he sat on, you know, this religious tribunal that was the Sanhedrin. And so you would expect for him to be conversant about these ideas that were circulating among the Jews in this day. And that's why it makes sense then that our Lord, you know, sort of gently rebukes him for not being able to understand what he's talking about there. So are you saying that, I I was raised to look at the John the Baptist baptism as the baptism of repentance. And the way I always had it in my mind was, okay, so people were asking for forgiveness, but I didn't connect it to the fact that they believed that there was something actually happening to them, uh, that there actually was a forgiveness that was communicated by it. I guess I was... Maybe in my mind, I was always thinking about it kind of in the way that you and I thought about baptism uh, as Protestants growing up, where it was just like this public, hey, I'm a Christian now, you know, uh, great. Yes. It, it, so they really believed that something was happening to them when they were baptized. Yes, the 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 monks at Qumran believe that in, in their community rule. They say, basically, you can only be forgiven by the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit only flows through the true community. We are the true community. Wow. But you've got to wash in the, in the pure waters of the community. And if you wash in the pure waters of the community with a sincerely repentant heart, the Holy Spirit will uh, forgive your sins. Where were they drawing now, this theology of the Holy Spirit? They were getting this from from Ezekiel 36. I mean, they don't tell us explicitly where they're getting it, but if you study the prophets, uh, Ezekiel 36, which we use as one of the readings for the Easter Vigil, it's like the sixth, I believe it's the sixth reading of the Easter Vigil before we actually baptize people. We read from Ezekiel 36, which talks about in the latter days where there will be this sprinkling of clean water that will cleanse you from all your uncleannesses, and I will give you a new heart and a new spirit, and I will put my spirit within you, says the Lord your God. You know, so this is the this is the clearest uh, prophecy. There's others that are that are close from Isaiah, like 42, 44, et cetera, that talk about the water and spirit be poured out and, and, and so on. But, uh, but I believe these, these monks were constructing these rituals in the belief that through them, they were fulfilling these prophecies uh, in, in this new community that they had formed. That's amazing. That's really fascinating yeah. stuff. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Go ahead. But John the Baptist now, he does not claim that his baptism communicates the Holy Spirit. He says, I'm doing this as a preparation. One is coming after me who's going to pour out the Holy Spirit. And this would be another difference between him. That may that could have alone been a reason why he got kicked out or something mm-hmm. like that. But John would have disputed with the Essenes over whether their water washing actually communicated the Holy Spirit. Obviously, by the time he's exercising his career, John the Baptist has come to the position that their water washing is not communicating the Holy Spirit. Not even mine is, uh, but this is a preparation to get your hearts ready because one who's coming after me, uh, you know, the Messiah, obviously, is going to give you the Holy Spirit. That's it is an ironic, John, that here you have the man who is filled with the Holy Spirit saying, no, 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 (laughs) I'm not communicating the Spirit. Right, that, right, that's right. Another right. one's coming. That's wow. That's yeah. really fascinating. Um, well, let's, let's pivot to another one of the the sacraments of initiation because we're talking about baptism here. What about the Eucharist? Uh, are there things that are in Catholic teaching that not, I'm not going to say are derived from, but that the Essenes and the teaching of Qumran shed light upon Catholic teaching? Yes, uh, I think so. Um, already, you know, this again. Let's go back to this monastic community. Uh, every day they washed in these waters, and they believed that was forgiving their sins. After they would wash, they would go into a a sacred room, and they would share a meal of that that primarily consisted of bread and wine, that was officiated by a priest, and it it it, it proceeded in a very liturgical manner. The priest had to reach out first, bless the wine, bless the bread distribute it to those who are gathered. And they did this in anticipation of the time when the Messiah would come and he would share that meal with them. So it was kind of a meal of expectation of the Messiah. Now, one other thing about this, uh, the historians of the time say that before they ate 
and after they ate, they sang songs of thanksgiving. Mm. Okay, And these songs we have recovered from the Dead Sea Scrolls. There was a book of, um, of praise songs or thanksgiving psalms. It, you, you study the psalms, Matt, so you know there's a genre of psalms that are called Todah psalms or thanksgiving psalms. Mm-hmm. And uh, there, there's a collection of new, like n- non-canonical psalms in the Dead Sea Scrolls called the Hoda Yot, which just means uh, the 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 Todah Psalms, uh, essentially. And uh, the, the best reconstruction is that these were the 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 song, the psalms of thanksgiving that they would employ b- before and at the end of their meals. And all of them begin, I thank you, O Lord, because, and then, it, and then these psalms proceed. Now, if you translate that, I thank you, O Lord, because, into Greek, which is the language the Gospels are written in, you get Eucharisteo Kyrie, and then go on. So Eucharist just means Thanksgiving. It's the Thanksgiving meal, right? So I asked the question in the book, did they have a kind of Eucharist? And I argue that, well, you know, obviously we do, you don't have transubstantiation going on here. I mean, they're ahead of themselves in in Thanksgiving (laughs) history, but you certainly have a meal of bread and wine on a daily basis in anticipation of the coming of the Messiah that is framed by explicit acts of thanksgiving. And I think that uh, sheds a light on what Jesus is doing with the apostles in the upper room. At the very least, the way that our Lord celebrates that last Passover in that upper room with them, where he reaches out first to bless the bread and to bless the wine and then distributes them, this kind of rigmarole, you know, would have been familiar to many of the apostles from their acquaintance with the Essenes and possibly other Jewish groups that would celebrate these kind of sacred meals as they waited for the Messiah to come. So let's talk about the uh, the Last Supper then and what Jesus did, uh, because while most of the laity are blissfully unaware of this, uh, there's been a pretty big debate in biblical scholarship for quite a while with regard to exactly when the Last Supper took place. And the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they all say that the Last Supper took place on Passover. Uh, The Gospel of John, on the other hand, uh, says that Christ was crucified on the day before Passover. And the apparent discrepancy here has, uh, as you point out in the book, it's contributed to the loss of a lot of modern commentators on sacred scripture. In fact, I think you mentioned uh, Bart Ehrman, who's one of the most famous guys out there. You know, he's he's kind of the the flavor of the of the year or few years here in biblical scholarship, and because he came from an American Protestant background, he had kind of a rigid. Uh, view of scripture when he ran into apparent di- discrepancies it ended up basically robbing him of his, his faith. faith yeah so he's not even right. he's like an atheist now or something i mean yeah, yeah. it's crazy yeah. um so maybe what i'd like you to do here is explain how the scrolls resolve in your opinion the the discrepancy on, as to the timing of the last supper yeah. and then maybe as a you know maybe as a former protestant pastor from the mean streets of uh, of downtown uh, grand rapids michigan you can comment on how this protestant dogma rigid view of of scripture as the only authority so sola scriptura in, in the way that you and i were raised how that kind of sets you up for a big fall when you run into issues like this yeah absolutely uh matt so um <clears throat> Taking that first question, you know, what what light did this scroll show, uh, shed on on this apparent discrepancy in the Gospels, you know, concerning when the Passover fell during Passion Week? Matthew, Mark, and Luke saying Jesus celebrated the Last Supper. That was that was Passover, so that makes us think that Holy Thursday was Passover. John says he's crucified on the day of preparation of the Passover, which makes us think that Holy Saturday was the Passover that week. How can there be two Passovers? Well, there could be two Passovers, Matt, because there were at least two liturgical calendars being actively employed uh, in the Judaism of our Lord's day. Um, You know, we're familiar with multiple liturgical calendars in our day. You know, there's the Orthodox have their liturgical calendar. Occasionally, our Easter's will coincide, but often they don't, right? Um, Then there's the calendar of the extraordinary form. 
you know, which has feast days on, on different days if you're following the extraordinary rite. Uh, well, in our Lord's Day, um, most of the Jews were following the temple that was being, impl- uh, sorry, following the calendar that was being employed in the temple, which was the calendar supported by the Pharisees. And it was a lunar solar thing where you, you know, every three years you had to throw in an extra month to catch the solar year up to the actual lunar months. And it was, it was a mess. Like a leap month. Yeah. 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 You had a leap month every three years, (laughs) second Adar, you know, throw in an extra December every three years. Um, that was that was what most of the Jews were following. That was what the temple was working on. That was a shift that was introduced probably around the year 150 BC, when, when when the high priesthood changed. The uh, the Maccabean kings at the time uh, took over the high priesthood and 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 became both kings and priests, and uh, put the uh, put the Pharisees in charge of liturgical issues, and the Pharisees introduced this new calendar. Apparently, the older calendar was still followed by the Essenes, and the older calendar had 364 days in it, which is a a, a perfect uh, 52 weeks. How they kept this up with the sun, probably what they did was wait and every so often put in an entire week, like a leap week every whatever it would be, five years or something like this. Um, but it was super important for them that they – they kept those weeks even because they didn't want uh, feasts to move around on different days of the week. Okay, so what? Getting back to the Gospels, what is uh, what? What light does this shed? Um, the uh, uh, most Jews were observing Passover in the time of our Lord, following the temple. But the Essenes, who are a major group, they had their own Passover. Their Passover always fell on Tuesday evening because Passover day was always Wednesday for them. Uh, Now, when we look at Passion Week, uh, I think we can make a lot of sense out of Jesus celebrating the Passover with his apostles according to the old calendar, which sometimes it's called the Essene calendar, but that's inaccurate. It's just the older calendar, and they stuck with it, okay? Other groups may have stuck with it as well On on a Tuesday evening there. And uh, so he celebrates Passover and then uh, uh, is arrested in the wee hours of, say, Wednesday morning, and then eventually crucified on Friday, which was the day before uh, Passover fell for the uh, temple calendar. Uh, I know that's a little bit awkward because we, you know, that gives us kind of like a Holy Tuesday rather than a Holy Thursday. Um, But one of the uh, arguments in support of this, Matt, is that it gives us a couple of days for all those trials that the Gospels mention, you know, before Herod, several times before Pilate, uh, before Annas, before Caiaphas, before the full Sanhedrin, and then a, a number of other events that we usually don't notice. But if you add them all up, there's dozens of events that happen between our Lord's arrest and his crucifixion that are difficult to fit into, you know, say midnight Thursday and noon Friday in kind of our traditional, uh, uh, you know, reconstruction. Does it have any theological implications if you're going to date it uh, along the old calendar lines? You know, I think it has beautiful theological implications because in the providence of God, you know, this enables our Lord to both observe Passover with his disciples at the Last Supper and also die on Passover a few days later so that both the Last Supper where he gives his body sacramentally and the crucifixion where he gives his body physically are both happening on Passover, you know, and and he unites in a way, he unites these two Passovers of the Jewish tradition in himself. You mm-hmm. know, it's almost like a reconciliation of the liturgical calendars that the Jews were observing. They both get united. And, and as, as, you know, as you well know, as Scott Hahn argues, you know, our Lord seems to not complete the last drink of the Passover on yeah, the fourth uh, cup. Yeah. Uh, the fourth cup. And he, but then he drinks on the cross. He seems to 
to uh, to suspend the liturgy until he d- d- uh, commits the final drink of wine on the cross and then concludes this extended uh, pa- you know final Passover that that unites these divergences in in the Jewish liturgy and, and kind of reconciles in himself. So uh, to me, it's just beautiful. Is it uh, does it seem as if Christ was um kind of throwing his hat in though on a on a personal level with the old calendar because of some of the things that happen as he's coming in I think you talk about in the book how he says to the disciples you know go look for the guy carrying a jar of water and you make the right. argument that this is an Essene that yes. he's going to follow and it was in the correct me if I'm wrong again but it was an Essene quarter of the city where there are a lot of Essenes who were living in that part of Jerusalem where he celebrated the last supper Yes. Yeah. So good. So yeah, in Luke, it mentions that Peter and John are sent into the city and they're supposed to look for a guy carrying a jar of water. Now, typically uh, carrying jars of water is is a strongly feminine gendered activity. This is usually what women do. It's rare for men to carry jars of water, Uh, maybe skins of water while traveling, but not jars. So that's odd. You know, it's one of these odd things that I think that, that, that the scrolls, you know, shed light on. But the Essenes lived in all-male community. They lived in a celibate community. Uh, we have reason to believe that many of them lived in Jerusalem in, in, uh, in celibacy because they forbade marital relations in the holy city. Um, they also forbade relieving yourself in the holy city because that would defile the holy city <laughs> when you get up in the middle so, of the night you got to go outside the city walls that's right you gotta you gotta walk about a kilometer you know about walk about a half mile to relieve yourself uh, outside the city <laughs> so for this reason matt they had their own gate okay the the, the historians oh, mentioned the man. se gate yeah now we have found the se gate to all appearances and it's it's only a stone's throw from the traditional site of the upper room. Now, the archaeology of the upper room has a strong pedigree. You know that that you, you've got first-century foundations there. Um, you know the the famous uh, Benedictine uh, archaeologist uh, Bargel Pixner did a lot of work on this. So, to to sum up. What we believe to be the site of the upper room is very close to what we believe to be the ancient Essene gate, and you would assume that the Essene neighborhood then would be in that vicinity. Then Jesus tells the disciples to look for a guy carrying a jar of water, which is looks like somebody who's living in a celibate community and doing his own women's work, so to speak, you know, and he brings them back. There's other connections as well, because they, they're supposed to ask the master of the house, where's the guest room? And we know from, uh, from the scrolls that they maintained uh, like charitable houses or rooms to, for visitor, for travelers and foreigners and the orphan and the widow. And they, they were known for their charitable work. So this idea of having a guest house nearby, you know, resonates with the Essene idea. And then later, as you mentioned, Matt, when Jesus goes out uh, to the Garden of Gethsemane, right. there's this cu- curious episode only recorded by Mark, where this young man is only wearing a single linen garment and then he he runs away naked when they grab his clothes. And that's a very curious thing, you know, wearing nothing but a linen garment. But it's it's what the Essenes did. They they wore nothing but a single linen garment. So and there's a long tradition that associates that young man as being the author of the gospel. You know, you, you go back and a lot of scholars over the centuries have thought that's probably John Mark himself. Mm. Then there's a further connection. It seems like the upper room where the Last Supper was celebrated was was the home owned by John Mark's mother. Uh, so that that brings you back around. And if that was in the Essie neighborhood, you've got a circle of connections that all seem to suggest that Jesus celebrated the Last Supper, you know, with the Essenes in their part of Jerusalem. Why would he do that? Well, because the Pharisees and the Sadducees were trying to kill him. <laughs> so if he's going to go into Jerusalem and hang out with somebody, he's not going to hang out with the Pharisees. He's not going to hang out with the Sadducees. He's got to go to somewhere else in Jerusalem where, you know, it's at least neutral. And that would be hanging out with the Essenes who are pacifists anyway. So there you go. That's really fascinating. Now let's, let's pivot to the second part of that question I asked you. Why is it that, 
when you kind of had the mentality that you and I are raised with, with this mindset of sola scriptura and a pretty rigid one at that, where the Bible is your only authority, why does that set you up for problems when you enter into the world of biblical scholarship? Yeah, it sets you up for problems because there are many apparent discrepancies in Scripture that you just can't solve on the, the basis of the Bible alone. So if you think of the Word of God as simply synonymous with the written text of Scripture, and you come across these problems that that appear to be, you to be unsolvable, you just throw up your hands, and it's like, well, God is deceiving me, or or, uh, you know, th this can't be divine because it seems to contradict itself. Um, as Catholics, we have a broader, more robust understanding of the Word of God. The Word of God, first of all, is not a book. Uh, it's not something recited. The Word of God is a person. It's the person of Jesus Christ. He is the Word of God. Now, the truth of Jesus Christ is communicated to us in two modes. Uh, there's scripture, that's the written mode of the Word of God, you know, kind of the, the written revelation of the Christ, if you will. And then there's also tradition, which is the Word of God passed down in, in a, a non-textual form. Um, it's, it's basically the church, you know, communicating from one generation to the next generation all that she is and believes. That is, that's you know, capital T tradition. <laughs> so it's not, you know, it's not secrets that are that are whispered in the ear of each new bishop after he's ordained or something like that. <laughs> it, it's something much broader than that. It's the church's faith, which is communicated in in non-written ways from one generation to the next, down through. But but the saving truth of the gospel is communicated in that way. So. When you look at the Word of God that way, it's very broad. It's like a broad river, okay, moving through history. You know, God, God's saving Word. It has a written form. It has an unwritten form, but it's it's this broad river. And then <clears throat> if you got a little eddy here and there, you know, it may disturb you. It may be a little problematic. You may not be able to solve that little eddy, but, but you're not, you know— you got this river that you're sailing on, you know, through history, you know, the, the tradition, the written word. OK, you're not going to be derailed by, you know, a little swirl over here. That is to say, you know, kind of a, some, some little apparent contradiction that you can't solve. The other thing about about our um, our Catholic faith, uh, Matthew, is that if indeed it ever becomes necessary that for the sake of the faith, one or more of these little discrepancies within scripture has to be solved or adjudicated. We do have a living voice of the Holy Spirit uh, in the form of the magisterium that, if necessary, uh, can intervene and clarify these issues. So if it, for example, became necessary for the sake of the faith to define, you know, how exactly Passion Week went and how to understand, you know, what's said in the Gospels, um, you know, the, the, the magisterium could intervene through an ecumenical council or through one of the popes, etc., and uh, solve that. So the church has the, the, the charism or the, the supernatural ability from God uh, to clarify um, ambiguities in Scripture should they become necessary. Usually they're not, you know, because, you know, for example, the no dogma of our faith depends on exactly where— you know, when Passover fell. Well, that's a great with, point because the magisterium doesn't yeah. come and just drop the hammer on everybody, especially guys like you who do this professionally as you're trying to explicate and understand all the things that are going on in the Bible. The, the, you have pretty broad parameters to work with here because right. the, the church doesn't try and ram every detail down our throats. That's right. A lot of details don't be don't need to be solved, and the church allows the doctors and the fathers, well, follows the fathers and the doctors, and and then allows further scholarship to you know to continue to work on these issues and propose uh, various resolutions. And again, should it ever become necessary, if it becomes if it becomes pressing, if there becomes some kind of heresy that arises because of a improper understanding then the church's magisterium can intervene and, under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, um, you, you know, clarify which of the possible resolutions of some of these scriptural problems is the correct one, and, and then we can move forward. 
Um, yeah. Well, I was going to say, speaking of biblical scholarship and uh, just being able to maneuver through the, the words of sacred, sacred scripture and tradition and explicating things in a way that makes sense, uh, you're great at it. And uh, I mean, you're one of the best. In, in fact, uh, a mutual friend of ours, Curtis Mitch, just whenever you come up in conversation, just speak so <laughs> glowingly of you. Just like he is the real deal. His scholarship is so amazing. And I yeah, second it. Yeah. And uh and I, I really pay him a lot of money to say that. <laughs> well, you might need to pay him more. I don't know. But I, I'll say again, I mean, this book, really, that we've been talking about today, Jesus and the Dead Sea Scrolls, Unlocking the Jewish Roots of Christianity, is full of some really fascinating stuff. And we really just kind of scratched the surface of a lot of it today. And I encourage you guys to take a look at it because it will open your eyes to a lot of things that, A, you took for granted, or B, you always wondered about. And I think the Dead Sea Scrolls, really shine a, a lot of light on them. And if you ever end up taking a, a pilgrimage to the Holy Land, you're going to have a whole lot better idea of, of what that place is all about after having read uh, this book, John. So thank you for this. Uh, my goodness, I think this is like your fourth or fifth time on the Art of Catholic. And every time you just really, you open my eyes and I, I know the listeners as well, other listeners uh, to a lot of the realities that maybe we hadn't considered before. And it just really beautifies our faith. So thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah, you're welcome, Matt. It's great to be out with you. Well, I'm sure I'll have you back again. God bless you. I expect it. <laughs> 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 yeah.